So the most difficult part is figuring out what your shape looks like and then what a cross section, uh, what the area formula is for your cross section. So that's usually the hardest part of this. <coughs> so what we're going to do is sketch, just do a rough sketch, and then we're going to draw a much better sketch. So cylinder radius 3. Let's draw our cylinder going up and down. So I'll do a vertical cylinder like this. So we're going to slice this up with two planes. Uh, before we do that though, what do we mean by the axis? There's no axis here. So what axis do you think that's referring to? So think in a cylinder, there's one axis, or one thing that makes sense to call the axis. The line between the middle of the top and the middle of the bottom. Yep, so this is going to be our axis, is the one that runs through the center of the cylinder. So when we say the word axis of a cylinder, this is what we are talking about. So there's the axis. So one plane is perpendicular to the axis. So why don't we just take the bottom to be the plane right there. So I'll draw our planes in blue. So our first plane will cut through like this. And that will slice a flat, make a flat cut. And we'll just say that's the bottom of the cylinder right there. Now, the other plane, the second plane, crosses the first plane at 45 degree angle at the center of the cylinder. So there's the center of the cylinder. And the other one cuts through the center and makes a 45 degree angle. So I think in this perspective, it's best to take our other plane coming in at a 45 degree angle. So our other plane is diagonal and cutting through. So it's going to cut through like this. And now we're going to try to draw that shape that it's going to make. So unfortunately, I'm not an artist, so I am having a little trouble trying to draw the plane that would make that cut right there. But it's supposed to come down at a 45 degree angle. When it makes this cut, it's going to, on the bottom, it's going to make that straight, uh, that straight line right there when it cuts through. And it's also going to cut through that point. Now, what other points is it going to cut through? It will form a curve here, and it will form a curve on the back side as it cuts through. So yeah, it'll sort of look like a cheese slice. Although not quite, because I think those are cut from a wheel, like a circle, um, not a cylinder. So they'll have a, they'll have a different shape. They'll be shaped more like that in the back. So it won't. It'll almost be like that. This will probably look like the shape if you chopped up a log with an axe and you did it in one shot, one super strong shot, and got halfway through. It would look kind of like the part that would fall out after you make that cut. That's probably the only way I can really think of a real world object that would be like this. So if you took a really strong hit with an axe at the right angle, the piece you would remove would look like this. Of course, it would probably break into 20 small pieces and fly into your eyes. but. If you could reconstruct it, it would look like this right here, where it came from. All right, so there is that little wedge shape. Any questions on how we constructed it? The tough part is going to be coming up with some cross section and then a formula for the area of that cross section of this wedge shape. So I'm going to redraw the, web, uh, the wedge shape, but I'm going to draw it in a slightly different perspective so we can see a little bit more easily. And the perspective I'm going to use is basically I'm going to take this axis right here. The problem is there's two axes that I labeled that are parallel in this picture. The vertical axis is parallel with this horizontal axis that's going kind of backwards. So that's a major problem with the way I drew it. 
So instead of having the camera in the front, we're going to move the camera over here. So vertical will still be vertical, but this axis right here won't be uh, going right at the camera anymore. And labeling axes up here, we have an x-axis. We have a z-axis is our vertical. And then, unfortunately, in the blue right here, which I have to draw right on top of the z-axis, I'll call that the y-axis right there. So we have a problem where x, our y and our z-axis look the same. So that'll be our y-axis and our x-axis. This is our cylinder right here. So that's our cylinder. Now that wedge that gets cut. So we need to draw that. And I'll do blue for the plane that the, so I'm trying to keep the colors the same from these two pictures. So our bottom plane I'll leave in the black marker and then the other plane I'll draw in the blue marker. So the top cut we'll draw in the blue marker. So we're going to go straight up here. So that's where the other plane will cut through. It'll cut through there, right there, and right there. So those are those blue points that I just made uh, darker right there. So those three blue points are down here. Now we're going to connect, connect them together with curves. So it's going to look like this. We, I think, only got one measurement off this cylinder. There's only one number in the problem. Well, aside from the 45 degrees, and the two planes isn't really a measurement. It's a count of how many planes. So that's not really a number, or not really a measurement. So radius 3. That's about the only real measurement we got out of here, and the 45 degrees. So let's think about that radius 3 and how that relates to our cylinder. So obviously. That means the radius is 3. That means the bottom radius is 3. What is the equation for a cylinder? Does it matter your z coordinate for your cylinder? If you think about the way I laid this out. Your z coordinate doesn't matter what your z coordinate is to be on the cylinder. That's property of your x and y coordinates. So z can be anything. It's all about x and y. So this is really going to depend on just x and y. What's the equation of a circle with a radius of 3 centered at the origin, like we have our circle centered? So that should seem familiar. Equation of a circle, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Normally we do a minus the general looks like that if you're not centered at the origin. So it's x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. This is the equation of a cylinder as well because there's no z coordinate present. So what that means is this is a circle for every single z coordinate. So it's the exact same circle for whatever z coordinate you're thinking of. So when z is 0, it's the bottom circle. When z is whatever, I didn't really label it carefully, but maybe 5, 
or whatever it is up here, that's the top circle. If Z is somewhere in the middle, you get all these circles right here. So change your Z coordinate and you will have the uh, cylinder. So there's no Z coordinate in our equation, so Z can be anything. So that means it's just the copy of the circle at every single Z coordinate, which is also known as a cylinder. In the equation where it's, I believe the top equation is where it's centered and the bottom equation is where it's not centered. What is K in that equation? Uh, I don't think there is a, oh, still zero. So I didn't move, I didn't change the setup, I just changed the way I drew it. So I changed our, where our camera was located, basically, or what, pers what view we had of this object. I was just thinking of, in the future, if I have a cylinder that I don't know that's not centered. You probably want to center it, if possible, because yeah. your math will be a lot easier. Like, your actual algebra and calculus will be easier. I just wonder what that K was in the equation. That's the center right there. So this is... Uh, HK is the center and the radius is R. Okay, thank you. So over here, our cylinder, I could write X squared plus Y squared equals three squared. So that's the equation of the cylinder. So now we have to decide how do we want to cut this wedge shape up so our cross sections are nice. So we should go perpendicular to one of the axes. Let's think about perpendicular to the y-axis. So if I cut perpendicular to the y-axis, my cross-section will be, it looks like a triangle. And I should probably switch colors so we don't confuse things more. Let's go with the green for our cross-section. So if I go perpendicular to the y-axis, I would get a triangle like this. So that's pretty decent shape. And I think every triangle will have the same angle right here, just from the way that that uh, wedge is set up. That's going to be the same angle all the way. So that looks like a very reasonable choice right there to cut it up like that. That's not actually the way that we're going to cut it up, but it's a very reasonable way to do it. And let's think about cutting perpendicular to the x-axis now. And what shape would that make? And we get a rectangle if we cut that way. Also a very nice shape. So we're going to go this route. I think you can go the other route if you wanted to. But we're going to go ahead and cut it this way. It's not very parallel, but you can, I think it tilted the plane a little bit. It is. Uh, the problem with that, so if, if we cut perpendicular to the z-axis, our first cut would be a half circle, which is reasonable. But if you look at the shape you would get up here, uh, would not be a half circle. So it would be, it seems like it would be a, what do they call that? So if you have a circle and you slice off a part of it and get the area, they have a certain name for that. I don't think it's called, it might be a sector. Um, but this is the shape you would get. And so you'd have to know the uh, area of that right there. So I don't have that off the top of my head. So let's not go that way. It's probably very doable though. So what I need is the area of the rectangle that I just drew right here. And let's think about what coordinate has to change so this rectangle covers our entire region. So do I change my y value to make this rectangle cover the entire region? So if I change my y value, I'm basically re-slicing the same slice. And now if I change my x value, this cross section will move through the entire region. So this is a dx integral that I'm setting up. So 
So this is a dx derivative, or dx antiderivative. And the reason is you have to change your x-coordinate to cover your whole region. That's why it is uh, dx antiderivative. The other way to think about it, how thick is this rectangle that I drew? It is super thin. It is dx thick. So its thickness is measured on the x-axis. That's another way to think about it. So I need a function of x to, that represents the area. And the third way to see it, depending on my x-coordinate, the area is going to change quite a bit. So if my x-coordinate is really tiny, I'm going to have a wide but super short rectangle. And if my x-coordinate is way over here, I will have a more narrow but very tall rectangle. So it's highly dependent on my x-coordinate. That's another indication it's going to be an x, a function of x. But no matter which of those you're thinking about, it's always a rectangle. So it doesn't change the basic shape. The height and the width are going to change, but still a rectangle. So I just said two magic words, height and width. Those are two properties you need to get the area of a rectangle. So we need two functions, h of x, w of x. So I'll start out with the width. If I measure these visually, the width measures the, the measurement that basically kind of goes into the board and out of the board. That's the width. And the height is that measurement right there, the vertical one on the, along the z-axis that I didn't draw. So let's start out with the width. I need a function for the width. So the width is going from that point to the other point. Good news is these points are both on the cylinder. So they're going to follow the they're going to follow the equation for the cylinder. These points are on the cylinder. So I need a function of x, so I'm going to solve for y. So I need to write as a function of x, solve for y. So on the cylinder, get x squared plus y squared equals 3 squared. And I need a function of x, so I solve for y. So that's not too difficult to do the first step. 9 minus x squared. Second step, we're going to square root. So we get a plus minus. So big minus small is very useful. You're going to use it over and over again. I don't necessarily like to go top minus bottom because if you're going sideways, it'll be right minus left instead of top minus bottom. Um, and if you're talking about depth, it'll be close minus far. But all these are sort of weird to think about, so I just think big minus small. So big minus small. So this should be a positive y value at the front, just looking at my y-axis right here, is pointing that direction. Positive y value in the front, negative y value in the back. Oh, look at that, plus minus. So the positive one will be in the front, negative one in the back. So our w of x function will be the positive y minus a negative y. Now, of course, we can't write a function of y. We have to write a function of x. So our positive function, our positive y value is plus square root 9 minus x squared minus our negative is negative square root uh, 9 minus y squared. So that's our positive y and our negative y. But we have to write as functions of x. So that is how y is related to x.
and you add this, you get two square root. Oh, yeah, they should all be, they should all be x's. So we need to be uh, producing a function of x, not a function of y. Now this might look a little strange, but if you look at the picture, if you measure that segment that I just drew, if you double it, that'll be the width. So you got the same amount going both directions. Oh, time for your quiz. All right. So we'll do the height in the next class. The height will actually be relatively easy when we see a really nice uh, property.